So. <laughs> Hey everyone, um, thank you for joining. It looks like we're still waiting for uh, a couple of people. Um, one of our presenters is is rejoining. Of course, there's always technical issues, but we're just gonna roll with it. Um, so uh, I very much appreciate everyone joining. For those who come late or are watching this recording, you know we had to reschedule um, this webinar due to the California wildfires two weeks ago. So I appreciate everyone's flexibility. And, um, you know, welcome to all participants, both live and joining us later. A little bit of housekeeping to start. And can everyone, Nora and uh, Gautam, you can see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So a little bit of housekeeping for all the attendees. Um, please make sure you are muted. There are going to be interactive polls during the presentation. We're going to go through kind of five sections. Um, any questions that you have, please drop into the chat section. Um, that's where the polls will, will be as well. And we have some people who can man that. If we can't get to them, um, we will be getting to them afterwards. There is going to be some dedicated time for Q&A at the end. We'll see how interactive we get. Hopefully there's not tons of time. That means that we're having a pretty spirited uh, conversation. Um, but just that little housekeeping. Any questions or if people are having trouble connecting or hearing us, um, please do let us know and we'll uh, have someone try and uh, attend to that for you. So, some introductions. My name is Andreas Becker. Um, and Nora or Pablo, can you mute yourself? I think it's just coming through a little bit. Um, I work for Law Yaw. Uh, for those of you on the call who don't know who we are, we're cloud-based document assembly and workflow automation software. I've worked in several capacities at Law Yaw and have had the privilege of working either directly or indirectly uh, with each of the three panelists we've assembled today. Um, I will let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Gautam, then Nora, then Pablo. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you've all been able to get a little bit of rest after this very wild ride of the last week. Um, you can stop refreshing your Twitter feed for updates. Um, anyway, my, my name is Gautam. I'm the Executive Director of Social Justice Collaborative. Our headquarters is here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what we do is uh, deportation defense legal services for immigrants. And we represent thousands of families each year uh, from Central and Northern California. Um, most of our cases are in front of immigration judges and we represent families and children. Thank you, Gautam. Nora. <laughs> You're up, Nora. <laughs> I think you're still on mute. Hi, um, my name's Nora Cregan. I am the executive director and founder of the Access Project, which is based in San Francisco, um, but we work statewide um, and maybe soon nationwide. And our goal is to use technology and pro bono um, volunteers to supplement and um, help increase access to justice um, by working with legal services organizations that don't have um, strong pro bono programs. And so tech is really important to that because we need to make sure that we have, that we're providing the legal services organizations with high quality, um, consistent um, volunteer work product. And also we need to be able to work all over the state and potentially all over the country. So we need a lot of tech to make sure that people have access to the information that we are pulling together quickly. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Pablo. So good morning. My name is uh, Pablo Ramirez. Um, I am the executive director for Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. What we do is we serve the low-income seniors and indigent communities um, in matters such as um, evictions, housing defense, um, consumer civil law, um, family probate and guardianship matters. Our goal is to serve San Bernardino and Riverside County um, the best we can by trying to use the resources we have um, in order to provide a service to a larger population. Thank you. Thanks, Pablo. Um, so uh, this, this is not about law, y'all. This is uh, much more important than that. Just for people who, you know, are, are not familiar with us, um, like I said, we're a cloud-based document automation workflow automation software. 
um, four years old. We're working with a thousand law firms, plus law firms, um, eight out of the 11 LSC funded nonprofits in California, somewhere between 40 and 50 nonprofits when you take into account law schools and paralegal uh, training schools. Um, a million plus documents, we just crossed that threshold. We're very excited about it. Over 250,000 e-signatures filed with courts. Um, our mission, you know, it's to democratize access to legal services. We start every team meeting with this slide. Um, kind of a broad and maybe ambitious mission, but um, through working with our uh, our partners, I think we've got a, a, a great head start so far. Um, you know, we'll uh, we'll go to this is uh, you know our agenda, uh, and I promise that I'm going to stop talking really soon since we're so lucky to have you know, assembled such a talented and esteemed um, panel. Um, but to, to Gantam's point, you know, it's, it's, it's been a long year. And, you know, when we originally scheduled uh, this meeting um, or this webinar, it was going to be during um, the ABA's, uh, you know, pro bono week, which is October 25th to 31st this year. Quite a bit has happened in the last two weeks. Um, you know, many people in this country around the world, they're, they're breathing a sigh of relief. There are a lot of people who aren't. When the dust does settle, same battle that our panelists and you as the attendees um, have fought will remain, narrowing the justice gap. Um, and that's becoming more and more challenging as economic inequality continues to trend in the wrong direction. So the goal of this webinar, you know, it's organized by this agenda, but it's really just to shine some light on the intersection of technology and law, particularly in the legal aid sector, the legal industry, it's been notoriously slow in adopting new technologies, but the, the impacts are undeniable. Some technologies a little bit more obvious than others. Simple case management software seems to be present in just about every nonprofit that I've worked with. Um, tools like video conferencing, e-sign, rapid adoption, especially in this past year due to COVID. Other applications such as client intake tools, document automation, more sophisticated workflow tools, They've started to gain traction in certain practice areas and regions, but aren't quite as prevalent yet. Um, with this agenda, we'll have a general structure to the webinar, but I encourage all attendees to ask questions. There will also be polls posted in the chat section during each section. These are really helpful. We build from the outside in. The more information that we can gather about the challenges you are facing, the functionality you need, the quicker we can try and build those products. Um, like I said, may not be able to field all questions and stay on schedule, but they will all be addressed uh, in a summarization of key insights following the webinar. And I'll be making myself available to address questions after the session and direct them to the appropriate panelists. So without further ado, let's jump in. Number of challenges facing nonprofits right now, elephant in the room's budget. Um, but there are a lot of other contributing factors, a, a data point I pulled um, using the US LSE as an example. The most recent intake census showed that 42% of eligible legal problems received no service of any kind. That may be low compared to a lot of the numbers that other people have seen. Um, you know, this is an increase of 1% uh, of over 2017, despite, you know, reported increases of funding across the board. You know, what are the factors that caused this increase. You know, budget will always be a, a, a contributing factor, but what are some of the more nuanced factors that um, each of the panelists have observed? And I'll, I'll start with Gantam and we'll just move through. So, I mean, I guess for us, we're, so we were a direct legal service organization and our bread and butter is basically working up cases. And so for us, the, the biggest challenge of this outgoing administration has been dealing with the constantly changing legal structure that immigration law has. Um, we've been thrown all these procedural hurdles with being able to get cases done. Um, you, you know, from the form side, obviously we've got forms changing constantly as a sort of a mechanism to make this work much harder. But, you know, just generally in terms of in-court representation, we've had basically almost a complete turnover of judges here in Northern California, um, mostly caused by the fact that the Trump administration has these uh, outcome expectations for how judges are expected to act. Um, so for us, we are seeing that, you know, with the shrinking budgets it, from the federal side is absolutely one big concern for us. But we also realize that, you know, we can hope for 
a more favorable immigration administration in the future, but we realize that history has shown us that um, we, there's pendulum swings with how immigrants are treated in this country. And so being prepared for the next onslaught um, against immigrants, and that, that may not be the next four years, but it may be something that we might face in another 12 years. And it may be you know, with a different administration, but being able to figure out how can we best utilize um, technologies to, to create um, a casework pattern that is sustainable long-term so that we will be able to weather other kinds of um, legal storms, as it were. Thank you. Uh, Nora, what are, what are your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> well, we have, um, I think for us, the, one of the challenges is that we work all over the state. There are obviously dozens of counties in California and um, the processes for many kinds of, um, of, legal, of things that legal services usually take care of vary widely across the states, not only, um, not only at the county level, but at the courthouse level, and sometimes even depending on what clerk you get, you get a different answer, um, which is very frustrating, but it shows us um, how inaccessible the, uh, the justice system is for people who are trying to represent themselves. I mean, if I'm running into these problems and I do this every day, then how can someone who's trying to file in procur do something? <clears throat> So that's why that's basically why we exist. Um, the Access Project. The goal is to connect legal services organizations with pro bono um, attorneys who can who can help um, guide clients through those processes. Because otherwise, um, you know, we can do all the uh, the one day clinics that we want, but if people walk out the door with a pile of paper that they don't know what to do with, then they we haven't helped them. Um, and technology, especially in on site clinics, which obviously we're not having this year, um, is enormously important to that uh, to that effort. Sure, thank you. And I, I think we'll, we'll come back to the lack of on-site clinics. Um, I think there's a, a sub story with what's going on with COVID, but, but thank you for that. Pablo. So I would probably begin by saying um, the differences in the, the different laws that are coming in now um, and the lack of understanding of the laws. So you have conflicting laws where you're focused on the CDC versus the, the federal law versus the state law, um, and then certain abuses that are occurring with on the plaintiff side where they tend to try and find a loophole to get our clients out of their properties or evict them for whatever nuance um, or whatever issue that they're trying to identify. And probably uh, preparing for this eviction wave um, while we're in the pandemic and figuring out how to properly address the different challenges that are going to come out um, because of the pandemic. So we do have some challenges where the courts are refusing or declining to let our clients appear telephonically. Our clients appear in person, but if they check off a different box, um, um, for example, that they probably in a couple months ago experienced some kind of COVID effects or probably not allowed in the court. Um, the court's inability to catch up to the use of technology to be able to allow our clients to appear telephonically. Um, and then just the lack of understand, understanding um, and the lack of being clear on what is expected to prepare a decent case in court and inability of allowing our clients in enough sufficient time to prepare um, whatever documents are required to um, prepare their case in court. And I think um, two other last things is the pandemic has kind of amplified the need to find a different opportunity or a different ability to represent ourselves in court or our clients in court using technology. Um, and then our lastly, our low income population who probably um, um, it's probably not as apt on technology as they should be, or maybe you have never used technology in the past. So I, I think just a kind of a wave um, amplified by the pandemic, it's just make, it made everything so much harder um, for our clients in our low-income population. Sure. Um, th thank, thank you for all that. I, I think that dovetails kind of nicely into, into the next section. I don't know if nicely is the word, but appropriately. Um, you know, I'm hearing you know, lack of standardization from county to county, uh, difficulty um, relaying information and resources to your clients. There are a number of, of pain points that you are experiencing 
some are appropriate to to address with technology, some not so much, some kind of a middle ground. Um, you know, when you're when all of you are thinking about this, and and you know, what are some of the key strategic and then tactical approaches that that you have utilized? You would suggest others utilize in identifying and then addressing some of these bottlenecks that you just talked about. You throwing it open? Well, if you want to take it, Nora, why, why don't you start? <laughs> Um, so I, you know, every I'm sure everyone on this call has heard and believes in the uh, in the maxim that you need to meet the clients where they are, and these days that means both physically and in um, and in what they're able to um, respond to and technologically. So, for example, we needed to figure out a way to get clients' signatures in the door um, without actually meeting with them and. Um, but but also being able to confirm to the courts that we are using true and correct signatures that someone has sworn is their signature. Um, and of course, this problem is all created by the fact that the criminal courts in California, um, almost none of them use e-filing. And so we still have to deal with piles and piles and piles of paper. But that's a whole other story. So we, we created a type form where clients would um, could sign on. They would promise that this was a copy of their um, of their signature, and then they would just take a picture of their signature on the piece of paper. And I know this is not an ad for Laya, but Laya has this really easy thing where even if the picture is really crappy, when you drop it into the document, it gets cleaned up and it looks just like um, an ink signature, um, which is nice. So, you know, that's just an example of one thing where we're like, we can't, you know, otherwise we would have to mail people this pa the paper and wait for it to come back. Um, and that was a way around that. Um, the other thing about meeting people where they are is the, if you have people, if you have some techno technological responses to things, like somebody can say, oh, I know, you know, I have internet access. I can I can sign this online and um, I can take a picture with my phone. Then you get rid of, you get those people through really fast without a lot of touches. And then you can concentrate on the people who are, um, who don't have access to technology, who need language assistance, who can't, who have, um, issues so that they're not really capable of following these long step-by-step -step directions. So the more that you can um, sort of clean out the people who are who do have that access and who can manage it, the more time you have to, to address the people who are more in need. Sure. Councilman Pablo, whoever wants to wants to jump in. Sure, I can I can jump in. I, I think recently, at least this year with the COVID crisis, um, dealing with the influx and the, of mail and just paper because immigration is so fundamentally stuck in the 19th century. And I feel like there's just dealing with the fact that our office has been closed and we still need to process incoming mail and getting that out the door, whether it's, you know, it's packages that go to the government or it's client correspondence or whatever it is, there's just simply, you know, very, I mean, obviously there are some technological solutions that we've mm -hmm. implemented, but I think the fact that we're dealing with a court system that has not come into the 21st century has been one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing. Um, so if there's some process we could do to sort of get together and, and get courts on board with some of the technologies that we're all using, it would obviously make an enormous difference for our clients and for us being able to be successful um, with work from home. Sure. So uh, I think um, a lot of different important points were hit upon. I think uh, similar challenges that we're facing, it's kind of with the court system, not just catching up and, and uh, at the same time with the court and the judges saying one thing, the clerk saying another thing and the confusion that that's causing amongst our clients. Um, again, with the pandemic, we, with us working from home and the necessity to catch up on technology ourselves, I, I believe um, just working on the different platforms, whether you have a smartphone or you have a, a non-smartphone and trying to utilize SMS tax um, for them to look at and, and receive different types of help um, and leveraging different platforms um, that use e-signature function um, in order for us to have our clients electronically sign the documents from their home while ensuring that they are certified and accepted by the ver various courts within San Bernardino and Riverside County. 
and also kind of leveraging our telephonic assistance to provide some kind of consultation <laughs> over the phone, um, avoiding the necessity for our clients to come to our office. However, that um, we we've seen one of the challenges there is some of our poorest clients or low or uh, clients who do not have any smartphone or who do not have um, technology have a challenge um, faxing or scanning documents to us. So also developing a kind of hybrid model for the lowest, uh, the poorest clients who drop off documents and um, for us to be able to receive it in a safe fashion to ensure that we are keeping our clients safe and keeping our our, our um, advocates safe. So just kind of a combination of those different challenges that we continuously to face. Um, but I think um, we eliminate a lot of them by leveraging um, technology and trying to meet the client where they are, as I think Nora mentioned, um, by using their if they have a non-smartphone using the SMS test, text function, and if they have a smartphone using technology that allows them to do more on their smartphone. So that's where sure. I think we're at. Um, that, that's really helpful. I, I like the concept, you know, meeting the client where they are. You know, each of you kind of referenced, you know, the, the other component of this is the, the courts um, at large and, and their acceptance of technologies and, and their movement. Um, just a quick follow-up, are, are you noticing trends, I know during COVID, um, immigration courts were starting to accept e-signature being a little bit more um, accepting of that. Are you, is anyone noticing trends that you think are going to um, kind of be longer term even if and when COVID passes? Um, <clears throat> so for, for us, and I should have mentioned that a, a lot of what we do right now is clean slate. Um, so expungements and uh, felony reductions. Um, and we leverage the pro bono community, which is mostly focused in Los Angeles and San Francisco, of course. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to provide services to people all over the state by having partnerships with legal services of Northern California, for example, or um, uh, CRLA, others who are in um, areas where there are where the pro bono assistance is much less available. So one of the challenges that we've always had is that people, one of the reasons pro bono lawyers do this work is because they want to get experience in court. But if you get, if you take a case from us and it's in um, Shasta County, which is seven hours from your house, then you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to do that hearing. Now, I'm very hopeful that now that the courts have gotten used to the idea of people appearing by Zoom, appearing by phone, um, that the Access to Justice Commission will allow us to continue to do that at the very least for people who are being represented um, by legal services or pro bono attorneys, um, because it's made an enormous difference in the quality of the representation we can provide to clients. Because otherwise we, we finish all their work and then they have to go to court on their own. And that's really tough on people. Sure. Um, that's one problem if you have, if you have follow-ups. I, I was just so gonna I say, Oh, go ahead, Pablo. No, go ahead, Gautam. I, I, I was going to say that immigration has been provisionally accepting electronic signatures uh, yes. as of March, but we are very concerned that that policy is going to disappear once uh, all the courts have fully opened up or uh, there's a vaccine. And we're, we're very concerned about this because you know, we've had a federal electronic signature act for 20 years, but immigration intentionally chooses not to abide by that. And it's um, it's very disappointing when you realize that there's only possibly one reason why they wouldn't be accepting electronic signatures. And um, we're, we're hopeful that maybe next year after USCIS and EOIR, both both agencies realize that it is easier for them as well it is as it's easier for clients and attorneys. Hopefully, they'll change their policy. Sure. So I have um, noticed that the courts within our counties have been more open to accepting um, electronic signatures. We have some challenges with one specific county. Um, but I think um, working together, um, they have been open to accepting them. They just wanted it in a specific format for them to be um, able to be accepted within their court. But other than that, I think um, both of our courts have been pretty open to change and open to the dynamic that's happening now um, in allowing our clients to e-sign some documents. However, appearing telephonically has been more of a challenge, I think, um, addressing our exhibits and presenting different items um, and evidence. Um, so it's been a challenge 
for our clients to present proof to the court in an acceptable fashion. But other than that, they've been pretty open to working with us. That's that's good to hear. And, and I know this is kind of some of this is California folks just because you're in California, but hopefully this is applicable to um, all of our attendees who are in, in other states. Um, moving on to our next section where you all can kind of have a platform to talk about the, the work that you've done. You've already touched on some of it, but I mean, the, what are some of the success stories that you can point to um, driven by the adoption of new technology? And then, you know, a, a follow up, how, how do you effectively measure that impact? Who wants to hop in? Uh, I will. Um, so <laughs> we, um, what we've, what we've, we were only a year and a half old, um, but I, uh, we started at, with a pilot program with Legal Services of Northern California, which for those of you who are not in California is, um, tries to cover the enormous um, northern half of the state, which when people say that San Francisco is in Northern California, that's geographically not true. We're actually like halfway up and then there's this enormous rest of the state that has almost no um, access to legal services except through um, Legal Services of Northern California. So. Um, we, they work in 22 counties and we started a project with them um, where we would do clean slate work for clients by basically I get a copy of their criminal record and I have a system with um, pro bono attorneys where we do a workshop. They do all of the work of preparing the documents um, and analyzing the rap sheets and determining what remedies are available. And then that work gets shipped back to legal services in Northern California. So the, the attorneys there don't have to do the kind of routine not very exciting if it's the, not the first time you're doing it kind of work of of figuring out all the remedies and making sure that you, you're using all the right forms and everything and then um and and then they meet then they meet with the clients as a follow-up um get them to sign in the days when we had to get them to physically sign and um and help them file so the goal was to kind of take the burden of the big chunk of work of a very routine work off of the legal services attorneys so that they so that their interactions with their clients were much more substantive and they could sit with the client and say why are you you know why do you want to clean up your record what else is going on with your life in your life that you need this and then that allows them to explore what other services and help the clients might need instead of spending their follow-up appointment with the client staring at documents ruffling through pages you know getting signatures all those things that they otherwise would be um, we, uh, we can measure our impact very easily because we have last year, we served hundreds of people who absolutely would not have been served other than with this, um, with this program. So, um, every single person that did a clean slate at legal services in Northern California is, which is something like 700 people last year in our first year, um, would not have gotten the service. That's fantastic. Um, Pablo. So I think with our organization, we've kind of did a lot of different forms to try to make sure we are accommodating the people who understand technology and people who lack that understanding. Um, so we've kind of done different hybrid models to make sure that we are um, addressing the different um, populations. Um, some of the models include leveraging technology, as I mentioned before, um, using um, different methods to do telephonic consultations, doing different methods to have them review their documents virtually, um, using Zoom meetings to try to meet with clients in an environment where they can see our advocate and our advocate can see them and also attach documents and include different documents that they want our advocates to review. Um, so they place the documents within the Zoom environment, and then our client, our advocates would then review the document, um, give them direct advice um, on the document, and help. It just helps our client to be more in person if they can see our, our advocate's face and build that relationship that otherwise cannot be built if you're doing it through a telephonic um, system. Because of these different technology platforms that we've actually been able to leverage in Zoom meetings, um, electronic signatures. Um, different um, telephonic um, using their cell phone to meet our advocates. Um, we've been able to help a larger population. I, I, since the pandemic started, I, I just pulled a report. We've been able to serve about 2,000 clients because of using the different technologies. Whereas within the first couple of months, because we were still adjusting, we were not able to help. A we were not able to help many people because 
we were still trying to put wrap our hand, head around the what's going on and how we are actually going to help people when the business model before was kind of a brick and mortar you come to us and we help you and now we have to kind of learn really quickly on how to serve our clients in in a different environment in a different world and how we kind of measured it we do have a comprehensive case management system that tracks the type of service we provided the the method of service so that allowed us to identify different areas of opportunity where we can um offer them greater level of service and maybe expand on some platforms that are being successful and our clients are are providing a positive solutions or resolutions or responses to the different um, platforms that we're using. So I just think a combination and, and measuring the impact by using our case management system and using technology has really been very helpful in providing a higher level of service to our clients who would probably otherwise go uh, unmet or services who they would probably go to court and prepare because of that. So thank you. So I would say that we at SJC, we're a fairly tech forward organization. So we've implemented a number of new technologies in the past year and a half. But I think that probably the most important one um, has been an interoperability tool, um, which is called Zapier. So if, if folks are not familiar with that on this call, you, you know, you may be already using a number of tools. I've heard Typeform, um, we use Airtable, we use, um, you know, we're on Salesforce for content management. We obviously use Laya, but getting data from one system to another has always been a challenge. And well, because we deal with such a high volume of intakes and clients, we just cannot afford to manually transfer data over. Um, so Zapier um, is basically allowing us to connect almost all of the tools that we use together um, to be able to drive efficiency forward. And I would say that you know it's very, very easy to measure impact um, because we're just saving time. We're saving time across the board. Um, and this is programmatically, but it's also um, on the operation side as well because the the tools, you know, almost every, major tech tool out there um, is offering some connection through Xavier. And I, I remember when we started working together immediately, you kind of just took me through some of your workflows and I was very impressed at what you had, had already set up. Nora and Pablo, I know that you've set up some um, really sophisticated and, and uh, effective workflows as well. Um, so I, I think we're, we're on schedule, which is great. Um, next section, you know, tons of technology solutions out there, um, but success is very often um, you know, governed by how well that's rolled out, um, or can you even get buy-in? There's lots of tools that, that you think will be helpful and, and securing that organizational buy-in can be um, difficult and challenging. Um, what are some of the challenges that each of you have observed when implementing these different solutions, both individually and organization-wide, and, and what are some best practices that you can share based on those observations? Um, Laura, you seem to be leading the charge. So. Okay, I'll just keep going first. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. <laughs> so I, um, uh, I, I don't usually tell people this because I think it hurts my credibility, but the Access Project <laughs> is me plus one volunteer plus a part-time paralegal that I just hired. So we did all of that work last year with that, that's all. It was me and technology, basically. So um, the, the the technology was, we wouldn't exist if, if we couldn't do it, if we couldn't use technology. Um, I was an English major. I knew nothing about any of this stuff except for like being sort of a normally sentient person. Um, so I've learned an enormous amount in the past year and a half. And one of the things I've learned is that people are afraid of technology. and. Laya with uh, just everything that we that every time I look at anything, I think what's you know is there an integration for this? What how can I use it? Um, the other thing to keep in mind if you are if you are in a not a tech forward organization um, is that all of this stuff is so much easier now than it was five years ago. Um, making a website, you used to have to know how to code in HTML, and now you don't. Like you just you just use Divi or another sort of thing that's like a plug and play for your website. It's super easy. Anyone can learn it. Um, 
So if you're getting, if you're trying to push your organization forward to use more tech and you're getting pushback, it's really helpful to educate people about how easy it is to use some of these tools. Um, and my whole organization is set up. The goal of it is to make sure that the, the um, volunteers, the pro bono attorneys are providing really high quality, consistent, um, consistent work product, because otherwise, if I send a bunch of stuff that needs to be checked to a legal services organization, I haven't done them any good. So, um, so we have basically created a lot of <clears throat> systems for people to do the work of analyzing rap sheets and figuring out remedies, which in California is extremely complicated and messy, um, by basically creating a, um, a flow chart for them to follow with, you know, the 15 different laws that affect it. And pretty much like, I think of it as like putting those cushions in the um, in the bowling alley, in the gutters of a bowling alley, like they can't get off track. Um, and so that means that I have much higher um, confidence in the work that they're doing. I can do more spot checking and less like redoing it. Um, and then the legal services organizations that I work with have confidence in what I give them and um, and are willing to continue to work with us. That's, um, you touched on two really good points, Nora. Um, obviously like no code systems that are becoming more prevalent. Uh, it shouldn't be as intimidating anymore. There's been a lot of investment in trying to make these tools uh, user-friendly. That's one of our primary goals of law, y'all. And a lot of the success that we've had with clinics is the ability for, you know, the, um, you know, the directors and the, the overseeing attorneys to, to put in those bumpers that you're talking about, kind of eliminating that uh, room for creative license or guessing, guesswork, and really just um, providing a really solid framework for, um, for volunteers and, and, and the whole staff to follow. So if, if I can take the next, um, one of the biggest challenges when I took over this organization is um, they weren't very ready for the pandemic or tech forward. Um, I'm very tech savvy and I, I enjoy using technology because I think with technology, we can reach a larger population um, with the same amount of resources that we have. So I, I think the challenges that we've faced or that I've seen so far are tech challenges um, where the lack of understanding. Um, before the pandemic, many people have not used or had not used a computer for more than just a typical um, purpose with email or some searching on the web. So they were not as apt and open to working with technology and probably in some ways fear technology. Um, in other ways, they probably feared the inability to change or adapt to the different environment. They were more focused on working in a paper environment where you can feel it, you can you can see it, you can hold on to it and something tangible that they just felt more comfortable with something tangible. Um, whereas now you're in a virtual environment and it's a, lo it's a lot of change um, and kind of adapting to change and kind of working with the change. Because one of the biggest challenges that I think people have experienced is kind of it wasn't a gradual change. You're kind of thrust into this environment um, with the pandemic kind of amplifying it. Um, you're thrust into in this environment where you now have to do so many things. You have to learn how to use technology, how to use Zoom, where some people have never used Zoom, how to use WebEx and these different virtual platforms. And, and then you have some of these other document, prep, document preparation systems that you have to try to use. Um, and some of them are not as user-friendly as they should be. Some of them require extensive training on how to do this and how to create templates and how to create forms. Um, and just kind of working um, in that environment just been so it's just been so overwhelming for many people, I, I think, um, in our organization. And I, some of the best practices that I've kind of involved is to make everybody feel a little bit safer, kind of created a collaborative environment where we're trying to work together to make this change happen. Because when I get their buy-in and they participate in, in the conversation and they're part of it, they kind of invest more of their time and they, they end up being more productive in the long run. And it, it becomes a sustainable change um, when they are part of the process. Um, I've also kind of worked with some policies to achieve long-term sustainable, um, kind of ingrained it in our culture and made sure we kind of went, we went back to the drawing board because that brick and mortar lifestyle that we were used to or accustomed at one point has to change now. We have to become something more 
um, as we go back and as I modify my policies, I, I think it, and they work together to modify the policies. It just becomes part of our culture and what we need to do. So they they feel more comfortable in working with that. And also kind of understanding that some of us learn in different different ways. Um, some of us are, you know, we like to see it. We like to hear it. We, we like to do it. So kind of providing hybrid learning environments where you have a one-on-one -on -one environment for those who want to just get more one-on-one -on -one attention more recorded training for those who just want to pause it and digest that information and go back um, in more virtual trainings, kind of using the same technology that they would use. Um, and I think the two last points is um, one of them is the flow chart. It's just kind of developing a visual component to how this process works. Um, and sometimes in, in our minds, if we can see the process, we can understand how the different pieces work together. And the last thing is kind of one of the biggest challenges is there's so much technology out there, but we have to understand that some technology is a lot more um, user-friendly than others. So I think um, identifying the user-friendly software that requires no coding, that has a, a quicker a learning curve so that they can learn a lot quicker. So technologies like, I know it's not a plug, but like Laya, where they compare to other document preparation software, it's a lot easier for our advocates to learn a lot easier, a lot more user-friendly. So they feel more um, more excited about working together. And, and when they see that their workflow and their, their job is getting a lot easier, just by grasping and adapting to this new environment, um, they tend to uh, buy in a lot more and participate more and be more productive. So I think, one of the big challenges for us is actually securing the buy-in from staff. And we've got staff all over the spectrum of tech savviness. And I think that's natural at any organization doing work for this number of people. But in, in terms of getting buy-in, I think realizing that pen and paper is sort of the enemy of productivity because it, you know, as, as easy as it is to write something down on a post-it note or on a legal pad, it's hard to get transparency or to share that data with other people who you're working with. And at our organization, everybody works in a team. Very few people are doing work on their own. They're working on a, in a team on a given case, on a group of cases. And so um, creating incentives for staff to start using the new tools, we are finding is the best way to encourage organizational buy-in. So if you start pegging performance expectations and success to using those tools and being able to actually measure that in a meaningful way that helps to encourage buy-in and it actually makes it um, exciting to start using those tools um, and i think that's really important when you're dealing with uh, right now everyone's working at home and we're maybe dealing with a hundred percent increase in the number of tech tools that we're using compared to before when it was just easy to walk over and talk to somebody and get an answer whether that was a client or a fellow staff member and now we're going to have to schedule say, you know, a Zoom call or, uh, you know, or to, to create some sort of an alternate system, which is a sort of a band-aid until we can get back to work as normal, whenever that is and whatever that looks like. Yeah, I, I think there are going to be a lot of um, longstanding benefits that come from, you know, the tragedy that we're experiencing. I, I'm in the office today. I this is maybe the fifth time I've been in since the pandemic started. I just didn't want people staring at my uh, my room um, for this. But we've had to, everyone's working remotely now, we've had to put in a lot of processes to be more efficient and be more thoughtful with people's time because I can't walk over to um, Tucker's desk. I can't walk over to Justin's desk and ask him a question. Um, so, you know, communication tools like Slack, like, um, you know, Microsoft Teams, whatever communication tools, I think it has been a forcing function in, um, being really efficient and thoughtful um, in our in our processes that maybe we took for granted uh, previously. Um, we've got ten minutes left, or about. Um, I think this has been really productive so far. The the, the last area, um, you know, this slide was uh, thought of bef before <laughs> whatever happened in, in the last you know two weeks. But you know, uh, uh, amidst you know some uncertain existing legal, economic, political climates, you know, what, what areas do you anticipate will be most in need of expanded representation and coverage? And, and you know, as a follow-up, what, what additional services or approaches are all of you considering to address these areas of expansion? 
Um, so I, I'm a sort of a process person. So I, uh, I let my legal services partners determine what the, um, what the priorities are and what the service areas will be. And then I try to support them um, by creating um, systems to get, to get them pro bono work that will be helpful to them. Um, so I will let others speak to that. I did wanna just super quickly add one other thing about the technology buy-in, because um, some of you are probably sitting at your desk in your, in your house going, yeah, but donors don't, you know, funders don't give you money for technology. They give you money for big, you know, pie in the sky things. And I think that, that is a, that's a real issue that people need to figure out how to address. And I, I, one, of the, one of the ways that we've been trying to do it is to, um, to show them how we could do something, like by you know, figuring out a process and then doing a screen video of how that process would work to show a funder, this, you know, doing this client would take me 10 minutes if you give me the money to get this technology versus this client will take us, you know, three days of go back and forth and all this stuff. So I, 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 I just want us to be realistic about the fact that the funding for technology is not like, that's not how funders generally think. And um, it's changing a little bit now that more funders are tech people, but um, it's really important to, to get across to them that they are actually meeting the needs of family law and immigration and everything else that's on the slide if they allow us to improve our technology. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, I, I think there is going to be, you know, and there are specific grants, technology grants that LSE provides. They are a fraction, a very small fraction of the, the total funding. Hopefully that's going to um, start changing, but it's approaches like like you just said, Nora, um, talking about what the, what the end goal is, the, the output, um, the time savings, and kind of changing our thinking of, uh, around, you know, how to to be a little bit more persuasive and how to put together um, you know a, a really powerful case for these for these investments. Um, Councilman, you can Nora Nora. I'm going to get Nora a break. Councilman, um, if you want to talk about the the last uh, last question, you know areas of coverage and, and additional proceeds that you're anticipating. Yeah, I was going to actually answer the question in terms of region as opposed to like type of law. I mean, I, we obviously can't speak to landlord tenant or family law, but I think the, sure. the, the rural versus urban divide in representation in California is such a stark divide. And we're really hopeful that uh, technology can help bridge the gap because the, the big challenge with rural service provision is being able to get service providers there where the clients are but also for those service providers to be available at the urban center where the court case takes place. And I think this is an enormous problem in immigration where you've got, you know, the federal government opened up a Sacramento immigration court to serve a lot of Central Valley clients. But, you know, despite that, what it was before, and it's still going to be this way for, for many who live in California Central Valley is a three to four hour commute one way to go to a five or 10 minute court hearing. And I think that this is a enormous challenge that I don't think can be quickly remedied by saying, let's just create court hearings by video teleconference. I think there's an enormous due process problem. The way the, the way the law is created is stacked up against technology the way it is, at least in immigration. And I think there needs to be kind of an underlying policy change there before some of these technologies, which already exist, can really help bridge that divide. Sure, that's helpful. And thank you for, for recentering the conversation. That, that This poll was a little bit of a selfish, I kind of want to get a sense of all of our attendees where they're practicing and you know, that, those specific uh, areas, but that's a, a really good point. This isn't meant to be limited to practice area. Yeah. So if I can just add, um, I believe that the biggest challenge that we're getting ready to prepare is kind of your landlord tenant. Just a lot of our blue color um, clients have been affected by the pandemic to the point that they've lost income and ability to pay the rent. Because of that, we're just trying to make sure we get ready to uh, prepare um, to provide them some support um, in the eviction proceedings. Um, finally, it's just kind of considering expanding our public benefits arena to try to be more open to helping our clients who are experiencing a loss of income. And that's where we kind of want to see our, our practice in helping our low income population.
Sure. Nora, I'll let you put a, a cherry on the, the top of this conversation. Oh, no pressure. So like, I, like I said, I'm, a, I'm not a, I, I try to follow the lead of the legal services organizations. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that as you are looking at new areas or areas where suddenly there's a spike in need, like if we start um, if we start getting a lot of evictions, for example, as Pablo was um, referring to, um, if you can't have people come in the door, we're going to have to figure out how to do intake for them using technology that is accessible to them. So, for example, I was while Pablo was talking about housing and an unlawful detainer, I was thinking, you know, we could create an intake form that a, that a client could do on their phone. You could get a lot of the information you needed from the client by having them just go through some questions on their phone that, that are really straightforward and, and simple. Um, maybe even being able to take a picture of a document like their three day notice to quit, for example, and um, upload it so that when you sit down to have to have whatever, however you're gonna meet with the client, um, that you've already got the basics in hand. And that's something that like, I'm, I've, I could do that in 10 minutes now. Like, and I, like I said, I, I'm not educated in this area at all. Um, but it's just really helpful to think about like, how can technology make this thing that's this giant mountain that's now in front of me um, scalable? And that's a really good point. I, I deal with intake quite a bit. Um, and, you know, there's that technology component, but we also have to remember we're just kind of humans and to be strategic about this, I, I deal with intakes where people ask a hundred questions, some of them very personal, some that may be better suited to, you know, maybe ask just the preliminary questions to get a sense of what questions you should ask when you're on the Zoom meeting with the person when you're doing a little bit of hand holding. So, you know, you'd be surprised at how many people don't give you the full truth, unfortunately, for fear of one thing or another. And, and, and it's understandable, but, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot for us to, to chew on here. Um, we have four minutes left. Again, I, I want to thank everyone who attended. Um, thank you so much to um, the panelists. I don't want this to be like a one-time thing. I, I want to think about like everything that's come out of this and, and start to think more collaboratively. I know people have limited time. There are all sorts of webinars people are joining, but I, I hope this becomes a series that we can start to really dig into um, some of these, these problems and these opportunities that we have. Um, if anyone has questions in the last couple of minutes, I'm, I'm going to stay online. Um, everyone's going to be getting, you know, the recording of this meeting, and then we're going to put together a, um, an overview of key insights and probably some sort of questionnaire <laughs> to the point of questionnaires, kind of just getting a sense of what, how people felt about the webinar, what was helpful, what would they like to dig into more, and perhaps, hopefully, my, my plan is to, to make this happen again. Um, do Gautam, Nora, Pablo, do you have any parting thoughts? Again, no that pressure. was my parting thought. So go ahead, <laughs> Pablo. Council. Um, I just think, um, you know, that with the world and the state that it's in right now, just adapting to the technology and having services or technology or software such as Alaya that to help bridge that gap makes it for for us. Actually, I've found it a lot easier. I mean, this is not the first organization I've been at that where we've used law and I kind of brought it into both organizations because I, I, I notice platforms that are very, very user friendly for our, our advocates and our clients. So just kind of adapting to this new world and using the technology that's going to help us be productive. Thank you, Papa. I would say that, you know, there's a lot of interesting technology ideas in the legal space right now, but I also think that at the same time, because of this need to meet clients where they're at, um, now isn't necessarily the right time, but hopefully next year or the following year will be. And so I feel like with a lot of these technologies, we've got to start rolling them out in a, in a small way and piloting them with a small group of people. And then hopefully, you know, those successful technologies that actually make a difference will survive and take off. Yeah, thank you for adding that. I mean, that's the approach that we take with all the nonprofits. Most of the firms that we work with, you know, get together, you know, someone who's very tech savvy, someone who isn't very tech savvy, bring them together and see if you can have some success with them. Um, and, you know, when we make this, you know, tool av available free to, to start for, for nonprofits, it really, um, kind of 
cuts through some of the red tape that kind of lowers people's, um, you know, it's very non-threatening and, and people really have an, an honest chance to try things out. I think it's really important to take things in bite-sized pieces, like you said, Kazan. Um, one minute to spare. Um, I, uh, again, I, I really appreciate it, uh, everyone's attendance. I'm looking forward to staying in touch. Expect emails from me, um, you know, just with overviews. And my email is right here. If you have any questions, just please don't hesitate to ask. You'll be getting something from me, but just just reach out and, and ask us if you if you have any questions. Um, but but thank you for everyone for attending, uh, and I, I hope to speak with all of you either uh, on the phone or via email soon. Thanks for pulling this community together. Oh my pleasure. We it all was, need to talk I, to each other more. I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, I think everyone does need to talk to you. I didn't do anything. You did all the heavy lifting. Um, so thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Right.